So this is, is this is an interview with His Excellency Ambassador Alberto Antonio Guania Marilla. Uh, dear Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today in Berlin, and thank you for excellent keynote speech. We have a few questions for you. Um, so first of all, what would be your definition of cultural diplomacy, um, and how has it influenced your work? Um, do you have any examples, perhaps? Sure. Well, first I want to uh, reply also my thanks because it's, I think it's a, a very interesting possibility to change points of view um, and at the same time uh, address the, the issue of cultural diplomacy. Um, in my case, personally, I've been quite attached to it because uh, I had been uh, previously working as Director General for Cultural Affairs and I had to do with the issue with the first time we met among the Ibero-American states in uh, Colombia, in Medellin. And that's where we all wanted to also have a definition of cultural diplomacy. It was not very easy to reach uh, a, a definition, but um, uh, I find that I, I very much uh, apply um, what Jean Monnet said in his uh, speech regarding uh, the construction of the European uh, common market. And if he had to think, do things again, what would he do? And he said, well, I would start by culture. And I think that there's a necessity. We need to address that certain cultural differences are sometimes what provoke conflicts. And of course, uh, all of our goal is means to, through means, like with diplomacy, uh, avoid those conflicts to happen. Uh, we are in a very complex world, and we are in a world in which uh, many times the source of conflicts comes from many, many issues. Um, I have been dealing also with this project that has to do with the um, Alliance of Civilizations in the United Nations, um, which is an interesting point of view, uh, but we also need to, to understand that if we do not understand ourselves culturally, uh, we cannot bind our differences. And that is where cultural diplomacy has a very uh, central role uh, in order to achieve peace. That is, I think, the, the, the most precious value that we all want. So I would say that if we do not have a, 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 a cultural diplomacy to, to, to solve, the, the problem that generate conflict, uh, we do not have anything. Yes, thank you. Thank you. According to you, could cultural diplomacy be a way to solve troubles in a more efficient way? And have you already used this type of diplomacy? Yes, in a certain way. We, when we, you say that, for example, certain values that have to do with culture, for example, I can give you a concrete example. In a time when they would say that Argentina and Uruguay we were a little bit in problems, we were also building how to put, for example, uh, tango and candombe, that are two cultural expressions, as uh, a, a world human heritage in the UNESCO, which has already been achieved in, in 2009. Um, so in a moment when people would say that we were almost uh, the merge of our conflict, we were being brought together through two important values that have to do uh, with what we, both sides of the Rio de la Plata from the river we think. So um, the, the contribution of, of, of culture is something that I very much think it's, it's, it's basic because if you, if, if, if you do not know what others think and how we can share certain values too, um, it's, it's very difficult to overcome uh, distant points of view. So I, I, I find it that I have uh, experienced that there's a, if you have a good use of uh, certain issues that can in, involve into uh, comprehension and understanding, uh, then you're ready to go. <laughs> 
definitely. Thank you. Um, how do you think tourism could be a sustainable way to help resolve the issue of the unemployment? Well, it is uh, a great source, as I was saying in, 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 in my speech, that Uruguay, for example, uh, considers that uh, Basically, all its gross national product is almost around 16% uh, devoted, it has to do with tourism. And of course, that tourism also generates uh, different industries that have to do to supply uh, with accommodations, with uh, restaurants, with all kind of different services that can be lent to uh, be devoted to, to, to the tourists. Uh, I mean, we have even used that new new companies that have to do with software, for example, they have invented or they have put in the market uh, ways to address those things to, for when people go and, and, and do something, when they order whatever they, that is used through a computer, you can have all those systems. And you can have people uh, being engaged in not only producing, uh, but also trying to, to exchange uh, what they produce through different associations that can be of the same thing. Um, nowadays, the knowledge and, and uh, the way of seeing how you respect even uh, the environment, how you do certain issues that are friendly to uh, a human being is what one needs to, to take in account. So I think that if you're responsible and that if you can build up all these different policies in order to uh, f make of that something that you have to empower, uh, the, the, the human uh, resources will be more capacity, will have more capacity to adapt to the innovation and, and the new uh, challenges that we have. Your Excellency, just following on that, how would you say it would be possible to develop and valorize tourism as an engine of growth? Well, first I was saying that even I noticed that um, tourism has not been put as one of the main issues in order to achieve development. The UNWTO uh, has, 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 has put it, uh, of course, as its, its, its main issue. But separately, it has not been put as a way to uh, understand uh, the growth of the economy as a whole. Because you can say, we are all devoted in combating uh, poverty. Okay, but how can you do that by uh, certain measures that have are directly related to tourism because when you cannot allow people to move and when you have conflicts and you have a lot of situations that attempt against tourism uh, you cannot have tourism <laughs> so um, as I was saying the first thing is that we need to uh, avoid the circumstances that go against uh, normal development of, of, of a touristic activity but at the same time make people be conscious that through tourism you can do a lot of other things. You can protect the environment, you can protect uh, people from being in, in bad situations, you can have all good circumstances that can be generated uh, through tourism. So it's always what you say, if, 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 you, um, if you destroy the gold mine, uh, what are you going to do with the resource? So, uh, and we all know we all, maybe all countries have their particular attractions, their 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 own creations in order to attract tourists. Um, but if you don't have a good circumstances, you can have a paradise and nobody will go there. <laughs> Well, um, I think that maybe one of the biggest uh, distortions that we have right now is how to address uh, the, 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 the problems in world governability. Uh, I mean, if 
if you cannot make uh, certain problems reach the table of, and make a decision over them, uh, how can you then uh, be able to solve them? I mean, we all know that we need a, a different uh, way of seeing things in the world, but uh, the reform of the United Nations is taking years. We are not getting there, and um, well, I, I say that maybe nowadays people have different ways of accessing towards uh, those issues. I uh, was saying that, uh, well, we have uh, proof that in Latin America, for example, in the, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, we have been growing a lot of middle class people. And that is fantastic, because you can say, well, they have access. What they did in my country, for example, the Plan Ceibal is one computer per child. It's, a, it's something that has been a revolution. Because you have a kid that has never had a computer, has had it there in his house, he took it to his house and he taught his father, his mother, and then they were in a better economic situation. They started buying their laptops or their iPods or whatever, and they got into the information society. So when you see those things happen, because when you give chances to people, because not everybody can come for the same, not everybody was born in a golden <laughs> craved, how you say, but you need to also see that if you want to democratize it, you want to make inclusions. That's why my country, as I was saying, has been so much devoted in the protection of human rights and taking that all those issues uh, need to be incorporated into the citizens and into the people in order to claim for their own rights. And that's what you basically need to, to go along with. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.